Cody. And we are the I are supposed to say this at the same time. Oh, we, we are can't the skull do crawlers. Skull crawlers. Yeah, I can't do that. <laughs> <laughs> and we ask you to suspend this belief, the show where we invite you to open up your open up your mind and expand your horizons as we discuss the paranormal taboo and otherwise mysterious occurrences in our universe and this week we're doing something a little different we're we're recording over zoom yeah we cannot be in person currently yeah it's a bummer sorry um but we still wanted to get together and tell some stories my wife and i are redoing our bathroom and um yeah that's kind of what we've been doing all day long and i invited or in over but it, we were just doing stuff too late so there's no way we're gonna make it happen yeah and i'm not coming back over until those clown or those uh dolls are gone so dude i got rid of them thank goodness oh, you did yeah didn't even have to I'm, be in a back alley oh nice huh? yeah How'd that go I, down? I met with chase uh in front of the building instead of behind it this time <laughs> okay <laughs> <laughs> and um yeah he was very nice and I asked him if he had any new developments on where the dolls might have come from. Uh-huh. And he told me nothing more than what I already know, which was okay. that the person he got them from got them from her grandmother, who I guess everyone hated. Okay. And she's from Mustang. So that's all I know. Oh. Yeah. That's all I got out of them. So... What was that town that we heard through the uh, spirit box? Watonga, yeah. Watonga, that's right. Okay. Yeah. Is it anywhere close to Mustang? No, not at all. <laughs> yeah, I even did some Googling to see if, you know, like, was there, like, a girl drowned or whatever. Oh, gosh, yeah. we haven't even talked about uh, what went down. So uh, we know a medium Mm-hmm. And she really wanted to come and meet these dolls in person. Her name's Morgan. Yeah. She's great. We're friends with her. And mm-hmm. so she came over and she met with the dolls and it was really interesting, really scary. We yeah. have some of these yeah. dowsing rods and that's how we communicated with them. Um, but immediately, as soon as she came in, she felt really sad and had to step out and had to mm-hmm. recoup and I don't know. It was very interesting. Or do you want to tell a little bit more about it? Yeah. Um, she already expressed to me that whenever we did our spirit box session, uh, my investigative style was a bit, uh, let's see, aggressive and yeah. <laughs> not chill. Um, so when we tried to use the dowsing or when I tried to use the dowsing rods, they just would not move like at all. Yeah. And like, we had a we had a little practice session where you used you used them, she used mm-hmm. them. Like when you used them, they were moving, and when she used yeah. them, they were moving. They're spinning all around me. for me. Yeah, for me, nothing. Yeah. So, yeah. Which was so insane because I was watching your hands; you weren't moving a muscle. When I was holding them, I also wasn't moving muscle, but they were just, yeah, you know, yeah spinning yeah. around like any time I asked a question, which was yeah. so weird. Uh, yeah, mine just stood still, like straight, like yeah, no movement at all. Yeah, the spirits don't like you, brother. <laughs> yeah, I'm not a, I'm not a, I'm not a conduit for spiritual energy, I guess. Yeah, and that's okay. Uh, a few things that happened, which were very strange, and we did record a lot of the night, and I'll get into that here in a little bit. But Morgan came over, and Orin and her sat down, and on the table, communicate with the dolls with the dowsing rods. And I was behind the camera, and my wife, Sarah, she came into the room after a little bit. And so we were just kind of observing to see what kind of energy Morgan was was getting from these dolls. And yeah. she was very sad, very somber as soon as she came in, which is strange because she wasn't like that before. Yeah. And she was asking all the questions that she had suspicions about. Mm-hmm. And she really thinks that this eight-year-old girl named Susan Mm -hmm. was drowned and murdered and her soul now possesses the Cabbage Patch looking doll. Yeah. um, Which was very spooky. And when we went into that investigation, I would say it's probably what, like nine o'clock or so? 
at night. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <clears throat> and she was asking all the questions and stuff like that. Um, but as soon as I got in there, I felt like super, like my, I don't know, my energy just was drained. I was completely gone. Yeah. And so I wasn't very much help. I was mainly just observing. I didn't have much to offer as far as questions or, mm-hmm. um, you know, stuff like that. Yeah. And after a little while, our GoPro died. So the battery just depleted. And that's not super unusual. So I wasn't concerned yeah, about that at all. You- that's because you don't charge it and you've been using it all day. Yeah, I do charge it, first of all, but I had been using <laughs> it that day. So that's not out of the ordinary. But yeah. Sarah came in and she had our baby monitor with her. And as soon, pretty much as soon as she came in, the battery started flashing red mm. as if it was about to die. And usually if it almost dies, it dies within just like, I don't know, like two minutes. Yeah, but we were sitting there for like ten or twelve minutes, and it was still flashing red. And I was like, "That's strange. Usually, it's dead by now." But I wasn't yeah. concerned about it because you know we were just kind of hanging out, and I was watching Morgan do her thing. Mm-hmm. And after the cameras died, we did we asked a couple more questions, but you know we we're I think we were all kind of done by then. Yeah, come back inside, and the baby monitor was fine. Like the battery was just like back to normal, Ooh. which is so Ooh. weird. <clears throat> and for anybody who doesn't know, we are in my detached garage slash studio, whatever you want to call it, which is outside of the house. And so we come back into the house and it was working fine again, um, but very strange. So I don't know how much I believe like in electronics dying interference or whatever meaning that ghosts are absorbing the energy yeah, but yeah, yeah. it is eerie it's a little strange and i know that it i is. felt really really drained when i went in there too yeah. when she was asking the questions so yeah. i don't know i did Very too strange. but i was like i was shocking up to uh just had a long day I was tired yeah. mm-hmm. um but yeah i felt that weird like drain like energy yeah. feeling that weird there was just weird vibes in that room all yeah. together yeah, and like so, this past week, I've been like just tired a lot. Yeah. So that makes sense. Same here for sure. Um, and I will say that we had the dolls for what was it almost three weeks now? Yeah. Maybe yeah, it was about. it was almost three weeks. Goodness. Mm. And literally every single night they were in my house, including even last night, I've had the most bonkers bananas dreams. It's so oh, really? weird. It's so much more detailed than they usually ever are. Yeah. And none of them make any sense. They're all like either really scary or mm-hmm. just like very, like my anxiety is just like through the roof. I don't know. Yeah, it, it is yeah. very strange. And it, like I am, you know, I was pretty scared of those dolls being in on my property or anything like that. Yeah. But I don't know. It just felt, it's just so strange. Like the amount of dreams that I've had, I've never had this many dreams every single night in a row like yeah like three four five dreams a night that were just so detailed all of them Mm -hmm. so weird that i can remember like all the details for but very strange so incredibly strange Um, i need to start writing these dreams down like we've Mm -hmm. talked about but i'm lazy so i probably won't do that (laughs) yeah i really haven't had any i mean i don't normally dream or when i do i don't remember them but, yeah. like, I haven't had any, like, really weird dreams or anything. Mm-hmm. Maybe because I'm not, like, in as close proximity to the, the dolls as you are or whatever. Sure. But yeah. I have been tired a lot, like, barely getting any sleep. Yeah. Very weird. Uh, yeah. I don't know. It's good that we kind of talked about it a little bit. Morgan reached out to me and Sarah the next day. And she's like, sorry if I freaked you guys out, which I wasn't mm-hmm. freaked out. Um I was, I'm still like it's hard to be like fully like buy into this type of stuff, yeah, like yeah. dowsing rods and spirit boxes and stuff like that. And mm. so there's a part of me that's always going to be skeptical about it, you know, yeah. because it is like pseudoscience and there's no like real conclusive answers, Definitive you know. Proof or whatever, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> but most of me, you know, believes that it's real or wants to believe that it's real or whatever. And yeah. I tried to look up, you know, an eight-year-old girl named Susan that was drowned. But, drowned. you know, how do you Google that exactly? And yeah, who knows yeah. 
who knows if these dolls even being on a list afterwards yeah, exactly and who knows even <laughs> if these dolls came from oklahoma or not so yeah there's literally no way that we'll know and that's just kind of how it's gonna go yeah the the <laughs> session was interesting because she asked i don't know if we caught it in the video but she asked a couple questions about like um do the dolls like where they are do they feel mm-hmm. comforted 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 by being in you know on your property or whatever and I was thinking about it. I was like, and they crossed yes or, or like they said yes. Mm-hmm. And I was thinking about it. I was like, oh, because they're probably like, I mean, if Chase like got them from somebody and keeps like, you know, mm-hmm. trading them off to different people who want to, who are interested in them, like maybe they're just like tired of being like swapped around to random people. And mm-hmm. like, it's nice just having one spot for a while. And it's nice being like on a show and, people seeing our video and their little, our little spirit box session. So yeah, if it is legit, they probably just like, like the fame or whatever. Yeah, that's true. They might've just liked the attention. Yeah. Um, another weird thing happened because you were trying to ask them questions, but they were clearly not trying to talk to you. Mm. And <laughs> can you explain the whole thing that happened that freaked you out? Okay. So, Oh, what was it? What was I trying to ask? Oh, um, they weren't moving for me at all. Mm-hmm. I was, I was going to ask, okay, what can I do to make this right? Um, and I was jokingly going to say, what do you want for me? And like mm-hmm. in my mind, in my head, I was thinking, uh, soul, but I wasn't going to say that cause it was like, yeah. it's too serious. Yeah. And then Morgan said like when I was about to say soul or soul, like stop myself, she said, they want your soul. And then she like paused, like she oh they paused gosh. and said, she paused and said, Oh, sorry. I didn't mean to say that. I didn't know what I just said. I was like, and I was just looking at her like, oh my God. that's what I was thinking. That's not what I wanted to say. And then the rods cross. So yeah. like, I was freak, like legit freak. Like I'm pretty skeptical, but like in that moment I was like, uh, uh, no. Oh my uh, gosh. That is horrifying. I'm going to get dragged to hell. <laughs> oh my gosh wow yeah, dude that's crazy and for the viewers um i will probably post that video i think the sound is probably gonna be really bad so yeah. prepare yourself for that we'll probably have some that was very sub- impromptu yeah too, probably, so. some, probably have some subtitles or something as well mm. just you know because but yeah it was very strange very eerie um, yeah. I don't know how I feel about doing it again, but <laughs> yeah, right. Like, I don't know, like based on this, like, would I be down to like ghost hunt or do something like this again? Yeah. Or, like, I don't know. It was weird. It was definitely weird. Yeah. It's definitely strange. Um, but we're going to ghost hunt. So <laughs> I don't know if we're going to immediately talk to haunted dolls or cursed items or anything like that. We yeah. kind of talked about it. Like maybe we will, maybe we won't. I don't know. Oh, uh, uh, if if after this, where when you've got rid of the dolls, they're not in your property anymore, and like yeah. there's like a immediate like shift where sure. you notice there's a difference. Yeah. Then I'm like, okay, then this is legit, and we should take a break from this, and then like, sure. I don't know. Prep like a. I don't know. Yeah. Like I don't like Warren style like. Taste where we keep cursed stuff. <laughs> oh man, that'd be so crazy. So it doesn't get out or whatever. Yeah. Wow. Uh, yeah. And for the listeners, we have a couple potential haunted places that we might go investigate. Um, one of them being this haunted Indian church in Seminole, I think. Mm. That sounds real spooky and real haunted. It has tons yeah. of activity. And we might go and investigate that. And if we do, it'll probably be out in the holiday season, or the, not the holiday, the Halloween season. Yeah, the holiday so, season. The yeah, our holidays. Yeah. <laughs> yeah our, our holiday season. Yeah. <laughs> so stay tuned for that. That could be a lot of fun because we want to prove that ghosts are real. I'll say it. I want, I want to prove to myself that ghosts are real. I gotta see a ghost to believe. Like, I gotta... I I know, I can tell. (laughs) (laughs) 
Well, cool. Uh, what else have you been up to? Uh, not much. Just work. Um, have you seen Incantation on Netflix? No, movie? no, I haven't. Really good. Go. What's it about? It's really good. Tell it to me. It's a, it's okay. It's about, oddly enough, this woman. She's a part of a YouTube channel where they investigate haunted stuff, mm-hmm. and her boyfriend has a family. Uh, it's a, it's Taiwanese, I think, the movie. Um, but they have like this ritual where they uh, they uh, worship like a deity mm-hmm. called uh, Mother Buddha. And they have this ritual like every so often where it's just family and like they do like creepy weird stuff. And so as this YouTube channel, they try to go investigate and then weird stuff happens. Uh, the boyfriend dies, the friend dies. And then years later, the woman's pregnant and she has a kid and she doesn't give it up because she's sent to like a mental institution God. after like surviving that whole thing. So, like, six years later, she um, regains custody of her child, and weird stuff starts happening. Like, the curse that followed her from that ritual is trying to reclaim her child or whatever. Oof. And the, the way it's told is, like, it's very, like, um, see, like, it's, a mock, it's like a documentary, like a fake, mm. you know, whatever. Um, kind of like uh, Blair Witch or like it's point, uh, found footage. A lot of it's found footage, like point of view. Yeah. Um, and a lot of it is like it kind of breaks the fourth wall. Like there's a lot of like the character talking to the screen, like talking to the audience. Uh, it's real neat. It's real trippy. Like it's interesting. It's a lot of like the special effects are like pretty good, but they're like it's super low budget. But like with the budget they have, it's super effective. And it's just creepy. Uh, if you've seen like, uh, yeah, I'm trying to uh, compare it to something uh, like Blair Witch or mm-hmm. uh, Paranormal Activity or uh, I don't know, just a lot of Asian horror like The Grudge. Gotcha. It's stuff like that. It's pretty neat. But worth a watch. Worth a watch. It's what's your freaking, What's your rating? Just, what's your rating? Definitely nine out of ten. Oh, it's really? worth a watch. That's yeah, it's really good. Um, there's a neat twist at the end, and there's a lot of like, uh, like fourth wall breaking. Like I said, mm. um, I didn't watch the English dub. I watched all the subtitles, but it's pretty smart. Like it does like some different things where like it'll cut between the past, it'll cut between yeah. the diff- like the present story and the past, the present story. Mm. And it feels kind of convoluted, but like by the end of it, it all makes sense, and it, you know you figure out like bit by bit what the story is. But it's neat. That's really cool. Yeah, I have to watch it. Um, I think Dylan Black recommended it to me as well, and he yeah. was freaking out about it. I was like, okay, I'll check it out. Yeah, it's um, a dope movie. Yeah, it's hard for me to devote time to watching a movie that my kid or my wife can't also watch. So I know that's that stinks. Yeah, it's a bit hardcore for Sarah, I would yeah. say. Mm-hmm. I know. But I'll check it out. I'll get yeah, around to it. Dope. Sounds good. Uh, funny story. Uh, a week, The week before last, uh, me and Sarah and Ash were in Illinois visiting her family. We're staying with her grandma. Mm-hmm. And little did I know that Sarah's grandma is all about uh, UFOs. And oh, for watched- real? ancient aliens like the entire time it was awesome nice. yeah <laughs> it was really cool and we were eating pizza from giordano's which mm. you know it's giordano's so yeah, good best pizza and i had my ranch here my pizza here and we're That's talking about aliens and how we feel about aliens and all this other stuff mm. and she looked at me and she's like what's that ranch called and i was like i don't know like restaurant style ranch i don't know anything about ranch <laughs> and she, she says she just looks at me and she's like and she says siri what's the ranch called where all the paranormal stuff happens <laughs> skinwalker ranch <laughs> yeah <laughs> i was like oh no i thought you were talking about the ranch on my plate <laughs> i feel so stupid stupid 
Uh, it's Hidden Valley. <laughs> I don't know. Thousand Island. I don't know. <laughs> Ding. Oh no! <laughs> of course, I know what Skinwalker Ranch is. I'm an idiot. But yeah, um, but yeah, it was a good trip. Uh, glad to be back. Yeah, but yeah, um, Orton and I watched Prey the other night. Freaking yeah. rocks! Oh my so, gosh, so good. I need like to watch three it three times now. I know. I need to watch it again. I still um, haven't watched the English version. Good. <laughs> uh, yeah, listeners, go to Hulu or if you're outside of the country, Disney Plus, I guess, and watch yeah. Prey, the newest film of the Predator franchise. It freaking shreds. It's so freaking Dope. good. Oh my gosh. Legit the best Predator movie since the original. Yeah. Yeah. It's awesome. So check it out. Um, I also watch They Slash Them, the oh, yeah. the queer slasher that's on Peacock, I think. Mm-hmm. It takes place at a conversion camp, so it's a fun summer slasher, summer camp slasher. But Before you, before yeah. you go on, you yeah. talked about this movie a lot, uh-huh. and I didn't know what the pun in the name was, <laughs> yeah. They Slash Them. I was like, yeah. okay. Heavy on the and slash. Like, if like a couple days later, like, slash oh slash you idiot (laughs) you dummy (laughs) um but yeah i mean i think it's worth a watch i don't know like i give it a like a 5.7 out of 10 you know okay so it's It's good like it's it's yeah it's campy it's schlocky yeah there's a a lot of uh i don't know there's a lot of a lot of cheese to it a little preachy Mm. Um, mm. But it does bring light to conversion camps, which I think is really important because yeah. those things are so messed up. And they go into this whole thing where they do like the electroshock therapy. Um, mm. Like they'll, like, there's this 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 gay gentleman, and they've got him like strapped to a chair, like with mm. the leather straps and stuff like that. And anytime there's a dude with like an eight pack on the screen, they shock him. And every time there's a hot chick, you know, they oh. don't. I know yeah. it's like, oh, that's it's sad because it's like this crap actually happens yeah that's you know? reality yeah yeah and in the rest of the movie they were just reinforcing gender roles where all the men would go out and like shoot targets and shoot mm. birds and stuff like that and they're like i don't want to shoot this bird it's like well you have to because you're hunting it's like dang and then the the women or you know the females would go and they would cook and they would bake and it was so messed up i was like oh this sucks yeah. so when the killings start happening, it's it's finally like good. You're like, okay, yeah. and they did a really good job of making these people suck, so you root for the killer. You know what I mean? Oh, really? Yeah, it was good. I mean, I recommend it. Um, not a great movie. It'll be forgotten yeah. in a couple of years, but it's it, it was written for a crowd that's not me. Um, yeah. It was written for them, them plural, so, not them singular. Uh. Kevin Bacon's like the only like big name in that, right? Yes. Yeah. yeah. And I think they got like a real queer cast too, which oh, really? is pretty cool. cool. Yeah. Um, I can't say that for sure, but like the mm-hmm. main character definitely, definitely is non-binary and you mm-hmm. know plays the part great because yeah, you know they didn't they didn't have to act very much. It didn't seem like it was pretty natural to them, which is really cool. Yeah. So yeah, recommend it. Um, other than that, I don't know. Yeah, what we do in the shadows. Oh, yeah. uh, Yes. Movie night the other night. Watch Tremors. Freaking rocked. Tremors is so good. Oh, my gosh. Forget how good that movie is. Yeah, Um, I've had that Blu-ray for a while, and, like, that's the first time I've seen it, like, a bit. Cool. It was dope. Yeah, Fred Ward and Kevin Bacon, they're back Mm -hmm. and forth banter is the best and i was talking to sarah about this earlier i was like how do you write dialogue like that do you write dialogue like that or is that just the characters bringing improv like or the actors bringing the characters to life yeah you know because like it's so good that it's so organic there's no way that they wrote it this way but maybe they did i don't know i had to read the screenplay but yeah i'm curious because there's a bit where they do like (laughs) so funny fred ward's character keeps like looking for a cigarette and he like checks all his pockets and Kevin Bacon always ends up having the 
or the lighter. Wow. Yeah. Like they do that bit and it pays off in the end. Really? I never even noticed that. Yeah, wow. where it pays off in the end where they uh they light the Whoa. Uh, pipe bomb or whatever. Yeah. And like the chick ends up having it, so she has to like chase after them and like cool light the fuse or whatever. Right on, right on. Yeah, uh, school crawlers driving went really well. Sold lots of mm. shirts, and it was a good time. So yeah. let's uh, let's get into some scary stories. Uh, I can go first. Sweet action. Uh, I am curious to hear what you uh, what you have. So do tell. I'll start with a new one. I just read tonight. That was pretty creepy. All right. So uh, what are you gonna be reading? I don't what's what's the theme it? tonight? What's up? What's our theme tonight? Uh, creepy pastas. We're gonna each tell some creepy pastas. Um, I've got a couple. I know you have a couple. I'm gonna begin with one called "Abandoned by Disney." Ooh, I'm already <laughs> terrified. Okay. All right. All right. All right. Okay. Here we Do go. Thing. Yep, I'm ready. <clears throat> Some of you may have heard that the Disney Corporation is responsible for at least one real live ghost town. Disney built the Treasure Island Resort in Baker's Bay in the Bahamas. It didn't start as a ghost town. Disney's cruise ships would actually stop at the resort and leave tourists there to relax in luxury. This is a fact. Look it up. Disney blew $30 million on the place. Yes, $30 million. Then they abandoned it. Disney blamed the shallow waters too shallow for their ships to safely operate. And there was even blame and they there was even blame cast on the workers saying that since they were from the Bahamas, they were too lazy to work a regular schedule. That's where the factual nature of the story of their story ends. It wasn't because of sand and it obviously wasn't because foreigners are lazy. Both are convenient excuses. No, I sincerely doubt those reasons were legitimate. Why don't I buy the official story? Because of Mowgli's Palace. Near the beachside city of Emerald Isle in North Carolina, Disney began construction of Mowgli's Palace in the late 1990s. The concept was a jungle-themed resort with a large, you guessed it, palace in the center of the whole thing. If you're unfamiliar with the character of Mowgli, then you might better remember the story The Jungle Book. If you haven't seen it anywhere else, you know it as the Disney cartoon from decades past. Mowgli is an abandoned child in the jungle, essentially raised by animals and simultaneously threatened by other animals. Mowgli's palace was a controversial undertaking from the start. Disney bought up a ton of high-priced land for the project, and there was, and there was actually a scandal surrounding some of the purchases. The local government claimed eminent domain on people's homes, then turned around and sold the properties to Disney. At one point, a home that had just been constructed was immediately condemned with little to no explanation. The land grabbed by the government was supposedly for some fictional highway project. Knowing full well what was going on, people started calling it Mickey Mouse Highway. Jeez. Then there was the concept art. A group of stuffed shirts from Disney Corporation actually held a city me city meeting. They intended to sell everyone on how lucrative the, this project was going to be for everyone. When they showed the concept art, this gigantic Indian palace surrounded by jungle, staffed with men and women in loincloths and tribal gear, well, suffice to say, everyone flipped out. We're talking about a large Indian palace, jungle, and loincloths, not only in the center of a relatively wealth wealthy area, but also a somewhat xenophobic area of the southern USA. It was a questionable mix at that point in history. One member of the crowd tried to storm a stage, but he was quickly subdued by security after he managed to break one of the presentation boards over his knee. Disney took that community and essentially broke it over its knee as well. The houses were raised, the land was cleared, and there wasn't a damn thing anyone could do or say about it. Local TV and newspapers were against the resort at the beginning, but some insane connection between Disney's media holdings and the local venues came into play and their opinions turned on a dime. So anyway, Treasure Island, the Bahamas, Disney sunk those millions in and then split. The same thing happened with Mowgli's Palace. Construction was, complete, construction was complete, visitors actually stayed at the resort, the surrounding communities were flooded with traffic and the usual annoyances associated with the influx of lost and irate tourists. Then it all just stopped. Disney shut it down and nobody knew 
what the hell to think, but they were pretty happy about it. Disney's loss was pretty hilarious and wonderful to a large group of folks who didn't want this in the first place. I honestly didn't give the place another thought since hearing it close over a decade ago. I live maybe four hours from Emerald Isle, so, so really I only heard the rumblings and didn't experience any of it firsthand. Then I read this article from someone who had explored the Treasure Island Resort and posted a whole blog about all the crazy stuff they had found there. Stuff just left behind, things smashed, defaced, probably ruined by the disgruntled former employees who hadn't lost their jobs. The locals from all around probably had a hand in wrecking that place. People there felt just as angry about Treasure Island as folks here did about Mowgli's Palace. Plus, there were rumors that Disney had to release their aquarium stock into the local waters when they closed, including sharks. Who wouldn't what? want to take a Hold piece? on. Let's stop really quick. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> they just released the animals that they had in their aquariums just into yeah. the water. That's so yeah. messed up. Nobody, nobody's there to take care of it, so I mean, just let them go. Yeah, if I, I guess it was one of the last people there and I cared about the sharks and other animals, I'd be like, yeah, just get in there. But yeah, man, like, that could just like really mess up the ecosystem if oh, yeah, the animals don't belong there. That's yeah. so messed up. Uh, also, I just Googled this, and apparently Mowgli's Palace thing happened in the 1990s. Yeah. Because I, I was curious. Anyway. Yeah. Continue. Continue. Let's see where I leave off. Uh, who wouldn't want to take a few swings at some merchandise after that? Well, what I'm getting at is that this blog about Treasure Island got me thinking. Even though many years had passed since its closing, I figured it might be cool to do some urban exploration at Mowgli's Palace, take some photos, write about my experience, and probably see if there's anything I could take home as a memento. I'm not going to say I wasted no time in getting there because honestly, it took me another year after I first found that Treasure Island article to get around to going up to Emerald Isle. Over the course of that year, I did a lot of research on the Palace Resort, or rather, I tried to. Naturally, no official Disney site or resource made any mention of the, pa of the place that had been scrubbed clean. Even odder, however, was that nobody before myself had apparently thought to blog about the place or even post a photo. None of the local TV or newspaper sites had one word about the place, though that was to be expe expected since they had all swung Disney's way. They want to be out there lauding their embarrassment, you know? Recently, I learned that corporations can, act, can actually ask Google, for example, to remove links from search results, basically for no good reason. Looking back, it's probably not that nobody spoke of the resort, but rather their words were made inaccessible. So in the end, I could barely find the place. All I had to go on was an old map I'd received in the mail back in the 90s. It was a promotional item sent out to people who had recently been to Disney World. And I guess since I had been there in the late 80s, that was recent. I didn't really intend to hang on to it. It just got shoved in with my books and comics from my childhood. I'd only remembered it months into my research. And even then, it took me another few weeks to locate the storage bin my parents had shoved it all into. But I did find it. Locals were no help, as most were transplants who had moved to the beach in recent years or old residents who just sneered at me and made rude gestures the second I managed to say, where would I find Mowgli's blah, 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 blah. The drive took me through an inordin inordinately long corridor of overgrowth, tropical plants that had run rampant and overpopulated the area, mixed with the native species of flora that actually belonged there and had, tr had tried to reclaim the land. I was in awe when I reached the front gates of the front gates of the resort. Tremendous monolithic wooden gates whose supports to either side looked like they must have been cut from giant sequoias. The gate itself had been gouged in several places by woodpeckers and eaten away at the base by burrowing insects. Hanging on the gate was a sheet of metal, some random scrap with hand painted letters scrawled in black, abandoned by Disney. Clearly the handiwork of some past local or an employee who wanted to make some small protest. The gates were open enough to walk through but not drive, so grabbing my digital camera and the map whose flip side showed a layout of the resort, I set off on foot. Already creepy stuff's about to happen. Uh, the inner grounds of the place were just as overgrown as the entryway. Palm trees stood untended and ragged among piles of their own coconuts. Banana plants similar similarly stood in their own stinking bug-riddled refuse. 
There was a sort of clash between order and chaos as carefully planted rows of perennial flowers mixed with obnoxious tall weeds and stinking blackened mushrooms. All that remained of any outdoor structures were broken, rotting, rotting wood, and various charred bits of unidentifiable material. What was most likely an information booth or an outdoor bar was now simply a pile of assorted debris chopped up by past vandalism and ravaged by weather. The most interesting thing on the grounds was a statue of Baloo, the friendly bear from the Jungle Book, which stood in a sort of courtyard in front of the main building. He was frozen in a jovial wave toward no one, staring into empty space with a silly, toothy grin as bird poop covered a whole swath of his fur and vines and snared his platform. I approached the main building only to find the outside of the building covered in graffiti where the original paint hadn't peeled and chipped away. The front doors weren't just open, they had been taken off their hinges and were stolen. Above the front doors, or the gaping mall where they had been, someone had once again painted, Abandoned by Disney. I wish I could tell you about all the awesome stuff I had saw inside the palace, forgotten statues, abandoned cash registers, a full-fledged secret society of homeless bums, but no. The inside of the building was so stark, so bare, that I actually think people had stolen the molding off the walls. Anything that was too big to steal, counters, desks, giant fake trees, they were all resting amid this empty echo chamber that amplified my every step like a slow rat-a-tat of a machine gun. I checked the floor plan, floor plan and headed to all the locations that might seem in any way interesting. The kitchen was as, you would, as you'd imagine, an industrial food prep area with all the appliances in space, no expenses spared. Every glass surface was broken, every door knocked off its hinges, every metal surface kicked and dented. The entire, the entire place smelled like very old piss. The huge freezer, huge freezer, not even remotely cool now, had row upon row of empty shelf space. Hooks hung from the ceiling, proudly for hanging cuts of meat, and as I stood inside for a moment, I noticed they were swinging. Each hook swung in a random direction, but their movements were so slow and so small that it was almost impossible to see. I figured it had been caused by my footsteps, so I stopped one from swinging by clutching it in my fist, then carefully letting go. But within seconds, it started to swing once more. The bathrooms were in much the same state as the rest of the place. Just like the Treasure Island Resort, someone had methodically smashed each porcelain commode with coconuts and other implements. There was about half inch of there was about a half inch of rancid, stinking, stagnant water on the floor, so I didn't stay there very long. What's odd is that the toilets and the sinks and the bidets in the ladies' room, yes, I went there, all dripped, leaked, or just ran freely. It seemed to me that they should have shut the water off long, long ago. There were plenty of rooms in the resort, but naturally I didn't have time to look through them all. The few I did peer into were similarly wrecked, and I didn't expect to find anything there. I thought there was actually a TV, television or radio in one room, as I really think I heard a quiet conversation coming out. Though it was like a whisper, probably my own breathing echoing in the silence, or just another case of the sound of flowing water playing tricks on the mind, I think this is what it sounded like. I didn't believe it. Short, unknown reply. I didn't know that. I didn't know that. Your father told you. Unknown reply, or possibly, possibly just weeping. I know, I know, that sounds ridiculous. I'm just telling you what I experienced, why I thought there might have been something running in that room or where some vagrants who had hold up there and probably would have knifed me. At the front doors of the palace again, I figured I hadn't found anything of note and had wasted the trip up. As I looked out the door, I noticed something interesting in the courtyard that, courtyard that I, had, I had apparently missed. Something that would give me at least one thing to show for all my trouble, even if it was just a photograph. There, as a lifelike statue of a python, maybe 80 feet long, coiled up and sunning itself on a pedestal right in the center of the area. It was almost time for the sun to start setting, so the light fell onto the object in the perfect way for a photograph. I approached the python and snapped a photo, 
Then I stood on my toes and snapped another. I moved closer again to get the detail of its face. Slowly, casually, the python lifted its head, looked directly into my eyes, turned, and slithered off the pedestal across the grass and into the trees. All 80 feet of it, its headlong disappeared into the woods before its tail even left the sunning spot. What? Disney had released all their exotic animals onto the grounds. Right there on my floor plan map was the reptile house. I should have known. I'd read about the sharks at Treasure, Treasure Island, and I should have known they'd done this. That's so creepy. <laughs> I was dumbfounded, just utterly stupefied. My mouth must have been hanging open for the longest time before I came back down to earth and snapped it shut. I blinked a few times and backed away from where the snake had been, back toward the palace. Even though it was totally gone, I still wasn't taking any chances and backed my way into the building. It took a few deep breaths and slaps to my own face to get myself right in the head again after that. I looked for a place to sit down as my legs were feeling a bit like jelly at this point. Of course, there was no place to sit down unless I wanted to recline on the broken glass and dead leaf carpet or haul myself up onto a desk of questionable reliability. I had seen some stairs near the palace's lobby and decided to go have a seat there until I felt better. The staircase was far enough away from the front of the building to be relatively clean, save for a starting like save for a startlingly accumulation of dust. I pulled a wedge of metal off the wall, once again painted with the abandoned by Disney motto I'd become accustomed to. I placed the wedge on the stairs and sat on it to keep at least somewhat clean. The stairway led downward, below ground level. Using my camera flash as a sort of improvised flashlight, I could see that the staircase ended in a metal mesh door with a padlock. A sign on the door, a real sign read, Mascots only. Thank you. This perked up my spirits a little bit for two reasons. One, a mascots only area would have definitely had some interesting stuff back in the day. Two, the padlock was still in place. Nobody had gone down there. Not the vandals, not the looters, nobody. This was the one place I could actually explore and perhaps find something interesting to photograph or wantonly still. I had come to the palace essentially agreeing with myself that it was okay to take anything I wanted because, hey, it's abandoned. It didn't take much to bust the lock. Well, actually, that's wrong. It didn't take much to bust the metal plate on the wall that the padlock was hooked to. Time and decay had most of the, had done most of the work for me, and I was able to bend the metal plate enough to pull the screws out of the wall, something nobody else had apparently thought of or hadn't been able to do at the time. The mascot's only area was a startling and very welcome change from the rest of the building I'd seen. For one, every second or third fluorescent light overhead was illuminated, even though they flickered and faded randomly. Also, nothing had been stolen or broken, even if age and exposure was definitely taking their toll. Tables had notepads and pens, there were clocks, even a punching clock on the wall complete with filled out time cards. Chairs were scattered around, and there was even a small break room with an old, static-filled television and long rotted out food and drink on the counters. It was like one of those post-apocalypse movies where everything is left in the state of evacuation. As I walked the maze-like sub-basement hallways of the mascots only area, the sights just became more and more interesting. As I went further, desks and tables were knocked over paper scattered and almost melted with a damp floor, and a large car- carpet of mold was slowly overtaking the real rotting crimson floor covering. Everything was just sort of squishy. Anything would disintegrate into mush when I applied even the least amount of force, and clothing items hanging on hooks in one of the rooms simply fell to moist threads if I tried to unhook them. One thing that annoyed me was that the light was becoming more sparse and unreliable as I went further into the dark, suffocating depths of the place. Eventually, I reached a black and yellow striped door with the words, Character Prep 1, stenciled on it. 
The door wouldn't open at first. I figured this was probably where the costumes were kept, and I definitely wanted a photograph of that twisted, stinking mess. Try as I might, whatever angle or trick I tried, the door wouldn't budge. That is, until I gave up and started to walk away. That was when there was a slight popping sound and the door creaked open slowly. That's going to be a no for me, dog. <laughs> uh-uh. Oh, In- no. <laughs> Inside, the room was completely dark, pitch black. I used the camera's flash to look for a light switch in the wall by the door, but there was nothing. As I made my search, I was jarred out of my sense of excitement by a loud electrical buzz. Rows of lights overhead suddenly flashed to life, flickering and fading in and out like the rest I had passed. It took a second for my eyes to adjust, and it seemed like the light was going to just keep getting brighter until the, all the bulbs exploded. But just when I thought it would reach that critical stage, the lights dimmed a bit and steadied. The room was exactly as I had pictured it. Various Disney costumes hung on the walls, fully put together like strange cartoon cadavers hung from his invisible nooses. There was an entire rack of loincloths and native clothes on hangers toward the back. What I found on, and what I wanted to photograph right away, was a Mickey Mouse cons- costume at the center of the room. Unlike the other costumes, it was lying on its back in the center of the floor like a murder victim. The fur on the costume was rotten and shedding, creating bigger patches. What was even odder, however, was the coloring of the costume. It was like a photo negative of the actual Mickey Mouse. Black where he should be white, and white where he should be black. His normally red overalls were light blue. The sight was off-putting enough that I actually put off photographing the thing until last. I took a picture of the costumes hanging on the walls, upward angles, downward angles, side shots to show an entire row of frozen putrid cartoon faces, some with plastic eyes missing. Then I decided to stage a shot, just one of the bedraggled character heads on the slick, grimy floor. I reached for the headpiece of a Donald Duck costume and carefully removed it so the thing wouldn't fall apart in my hands. As I looked into the face of the wide-eyed, moldering head, a loud clattering sound made me jump with fright. I looked down on my feet, and there between my shoes was a human skull. It had fallen out of the mascot head and shattered into pieces at my feet. Only the empty face and lower jaw remained, staring up at me. I (laughs) I dropped the duck head immediately, as you'd expect, and moved for the door. As I stood in the doorway, I looked back to the skull on the floor. I had to take a picture of it. I had to, for any number of reasons that may seem silly, but only if you don't think it through. I need proof of what happened, especially if Disney was going to somehow make this go away. I had no doubt in my mind right from the start that even if it was just gross negligence, Disney was responsible for this. That's when Mickey, that photo negative opposite Mickey in the middle of the floor, started to get up. What? (laughs) No. (laughs) First sitting up, then climbing to its feet. The Mickey Mouse costume, or whoever was inside of it, stood there at the center of the room, its fake face just staring directly at me as I mumbled, no, 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 over and over (laughs) and over. It's me right now. (laughs) With shaking hands, a violently thrashing heart, and legs that had once again turned to jelly, I managed to lift the camera and aim it at the opposite creature, now quietly sizing me up. The digital camera screen displayed only dead pixels in the shape of the thing. It was a perfect silhouette of the Mickey costume. As the camera moved in my unsteady hands, the dead pixels spread, marring the screen wherever Mickey's outline moved to. Then the camera died, went blank and quiet and broken. No. no. I raised my eyes once again. <laughs> uh, <laughs> spooky. Okay. Yep. I raised my eyes once again to the Mickey Mouse costume. Hey, it said in a hushed, perverted, 
but perfectly executed Mickey Mouse voice. Want to see my head come off? It started to pull at its own head, working its clumsy, glove-clad fingers around its neck with clawing, impatient movements, similar to a wounded man trying to pull himself free of a predator's jaws. As it worked its digits into its neck, so much blood. So much thick, chunky, yellow blood. I turned away as I heard a sickening tearing of cloth and and flesh, only cared about getting away. Above the door out of the room, out of this room, I saw the final message clawed into the metal with bone or fingernails. Abandoned by God. I never got the pictures out of the camera. I never wrote the blog entry about it. After I ran from that place, fled for my sanity, if not my very life, I knew why Disney didn't want anyone to know about this place. They didn't want anyone like me getting in. They didn't want anything like that getting out. The end. Oh my gosh, dude. <laughs> chills, dog. Chills. That is horrifying. Oh my yeah, gosh. Dude. It's very, uh, after I read it the first time, it's very, uh, Five Nights at Freddy's kind of. Oh, yeah. Good point. Yeah. Yeah. Still spooky, That's though. So messed up. I didn't know what to expect at the end. I didn't either when I first read it. I was like, okay, where's this going? No, like the whole setup was so eerie and so spooky. Mm -hmm. But I didn't see that, like, I I guess that supernatural uh, ending coming. Because holy crap, that's messed up. Yeah, what really did it for me when I was reading it, it was like at the end, the Mm -hmm. sign over the wall says, Abandoned by God. I was like, yeah. No! (laughs) Thank you. Yeah, that's crazy. that's abandoned by Disney. I mean, I'm sure there's art of that out there too. So if you want to get freaked out, yeah, I'll see if I can Google it and put it in this, yeah. uh, put it in the video. Because holy crap, yeah, <laughs> that, that went that went hard, man. That went real hard. Mm-hmm. All right, what do you got? Oh, okay. Uh, Give me a second, my dog is being annoying. Get, get. All right. Okay, so this is kind of a popular Reddit thread called I'm a search and rescue officer for the U.S. Forest Service and I have some stories to tell. Do you know about this one? I don't think so, no. Okay. Um, I heard about this one a couple of years ago, but I didn't like really read into it very much. Mm. I just heard like, you know, I've heard the staircase stories and stuff like that, or at least some of them. Mm. Um, so we'll get a little bit into the random staircases in the woods and I've got some, I'm aware of that. Like I've seen pictures of that. Yeah. Yeah. All right. So I'm going to go get started. I'm a search and rescue officer for the U.S. Forest Service, and I have some stories to tell. I wasn't sure where else to post these stories, so I figured I'd share them on here. I've been a search and rescue officer for a few years now, and along the way I've seen some things that I think you guys will be interested in. I have a pretty good track record for finding missing people. Most of the time, they just wander off the path or slip down a small cliff, and they can't find their way back. The majority of them have heard the old stay where you are thing and don't wander far. But I've had two cases where that didn't happen. Both of them bother me a lot. I use them as motivation to search even harder for the missing persons cases I get called on. The first was a little boy who went out berry picking with his parents. And I should preface this. uh, Missing children. Sometimes children are found dead. So beware because some of these stories are pretty macabre and pretty messed up. So listen at your own risk. The first story was about a little boy who was out berry picking with his parents. He and his sister were together. Both of them went missing around the same time. Their parents lost sight of them for a few seconds. And in that time, both of the kids apparently wandered off. When their parents couldn't find them, they called us. We came out to the search area. We found the daughter pretty quickly, and when she asked where her brother was, she told us that he'd been taken away 
by the bear man. She said he gave her berries and, he, and told her to stay quiet while he wanted to play with her brother for a while. The last she saw her brother, he was riding on the shoulders of the bear man and seemed calm. Of course, our first thought was abduction, but we never found a trace of another human being in that area. The little girl was insistent that he wasn't a normal man, but that he was tall and covered in hair like a bear and that he had a weird face. We searched that area for weeks. It was one of the longest calls I'd ever been on, but we never found a single trace of that kid. The other was a young woman who was out hiking with her mom and grandpa. According to the mother, her daughter had climbed up into a tree to get a better, better view of the forest, and she'd never come back down. They waited at the base of the tree for hours, calling her name. Before they called, her, before they called for help, again, we searched everywhere and we never found a trace of her i have no idea where she could have possibly have gone because neither her mother or grandpa grandfather saw her come down a few times i've been out on my own searching with a canine and they've tried to lead me straight up cliffs not hills not even rock faces straight sheer cliffs with no possible handholds it's always baffling and in those cases, we find, usually find the person on the other side of the cliff or miles away from where the canine has led us. I'm sure there's an explanation, but it's sort of strange. One particular sad case involved the recovery of a body. Ooh, okay, I'm going to skip this one. Patty, come here. Ugh. Uh, we got, I got seven minutes left. I can finish this part of the story. All right. I was teamed up with another search and rescue officer because we received reports of bears in the area. We were looking for a guy who hadn't come home from a climbing trip he was supposed to. And we ended up having to do some serious climbing to get there where he, sorry, we ended up having to do some serious climbing to get where he, where we figured he'd be. We found him trapped in a small crevasse with a broken leg. It was not pleasant. He had been in there for almost two days, and his leg was obviously infected. We were able to get him to a chopper, and I heard from the, one of the EMPs that the guy was completely inconsolable. He kept talking about how he had been doing fine, and when he'd gotten to the top, a man had been there. He said the guy had no climbing equipment. He was wearing a parka, his ski pants he turned he walked up to the guy and when the guy turned around he said he had no face it was just blank he was freaked out and ended up trying to get off the mountain too fast which is why he had fallen he said he could hear the guy all night climbing down the mountain and letting out these horrible muffled screams <laughs> that story bothered the heck out of me I'm glad I wasn't there to hear it one of this i know dude horrifying. straight up the the cover of the thing chasing after you yeah oh the, oh. the parka with a no mat no face oh. Oh, that's so scary Ugh. one of the scariest things that ever happened to me involved the search of a young woman who'd gotten separated from her hiking group we were out until late at night because the dogs had picked up her scent when we found her she was curled up under a large rotted log she was missing her shoes and her pack, and she was clearly in shock. She didn't have any injuries, and we were able to get her to walk back along. We were able to get her to walk back with us to base ops. Along the way, she kept looking behind us and asking why that big man with black eyes was following us. We couldn't see anyone, so we just wrote it off as some weird symptom of shock. But the closer we got to base, the more agitated this woman got. She kept asking me to tell me to tell him to stop making faces at her. At one point, she stopped and turned around and started yelling into the forest, saying that she wanted him to leave her alone. She wasn't going to go with him, she said. She wouldn't give us, and she wouldn't give us to him. We finally got her to keep moving, 
but we started hearing those weird noises coming from all around us. It was almost like coughing, but in a more rhythmic and deeper way. It was almost insect-like. I don't really know how else to describe it. When we are within sight of base ops, the woman turns to me and her eyes are about as wide as a human could open them. She touches my shoulder and says, he tells you to speed up. He doesn't like looking at the scar in your neck. I have a very small scar at the base of my neck, but it's mostly hidden under my collar. And I have no idea how this woman saw it. Right after she says it, I hear the weird coughing right in my ear. I was just about jumped. I just about jumped out of my skin. I hustled to, I hustled her to ops, trying not to show her how freaked I was. But I have to say, I'm really happy. I was really happy when we left the area that night. The last one I'll tell you, and this is probably the weirdest story I have. Now, I don't know if this is true in every search and rescue unit, but in mine, it's sort of an unspoken, regular thing we run into. You can try asking about it with other search and rescue officers, but even if they know what they're what you're talking about, they probably won't say anything about it. We've been told not to talk about it by our superiors. At this point, we've all gotten so used to it that it doesn't even seem weird anymore. On just about every case where we're really far into the wilderness, I'm talking 30, 40 miles, at some point we'll find a staircase in the middle of the woods. It's almost like you took the stairs in your house, cut them out, and put them into the forest. I asked about it, and the first time I saw some, and the other officer just told me not to worry about it, that it was normal. Everyone I asked said the same thing. I wanted to go check them out, but I was told, very empathetically, that I should never go anywhere near them. I'm just sort of ignore them for now. I just sort of ignore them for now when I run into them because it happens so frequently. I have a lot of more stories to tell, and I'm suppose I suppose if there's anyone interested, I'll tell some more. Tell some of them tomorrow. If anyone has any theories about the stairs, or if you've seen them too, let me know. So that's where I'll stop for now. There okay. are a lot of different parts to this story, and I can get okay. to them on another episode. They're all real messed up, and so, uh, they will give you nightmares. And it, you know, makes me want to go outside up. and go camping. So I'm already freaked by the by the big black eyes, the thing behind you, uh-huh. the the thing at the top of the mountain chasing the dude down. Yeah, you I, hear it the whole night. Yeah, <sighs> that's so messed up, dude. <laughs> yeah, there's a lot more to that story. Um, tons and tons of stories from this guy from this particular um i guess redditor mm-hmm. and um you know it's it's an r no sleep forum so he's posting anonymously because he can get in a lot of trouble for telling these stories because a lot of it like you know you're not allowed to talk about like missing yeah people like and stuff like probably that probably sign an nda when you're yeah you're not allowed to say yeah. some, talk about too much of that stuff mm-hmm. um but you know it might be real. These stories yeah. might not be real, but I they're horrifying. So I'm entertained by them and yeah. I can't wait to tell some more later on. So stay tuned, guys. You'll hear more about search and rescue missions and like the weird things that happen out there. So yeah, for sure. All right. Uh, well, that's going to do it for this episode of Suspend Disbelief. Yeah. Uh, Thank you for tuning in. Uh, yeah. If you like the show, please rate and review us on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Google, or your podcast app of choice. You can find us on Instagram at the Skull Crawlers and YouTube under the Skull Crawlers Movie Club. And now we have a Twitter as well, uh, underscore the Skull Crawlers. So, Heck yeah. Yeah. Hit us up if you got stories. Um, send them over. DM us. Yes, please. Uh, whatever, because I want to tell some stories. And if you, you know, just like want to, I don't know. Yeah, tell some stories. Yeah, whatever, whatever spooky experience you had. We want to read them on the show eventually, maybe as a season finale. Who knows? And that's the end of the episode. Thanks for tuning in, guys. We'll talk to you later. Peace. <laughs>